our most coveted episode of the year. This is the most important conversation I may ever share on this podcast, and it's been years in the making. We've recorded, scrapped, and rescheduled this interview several times, and I think it's no coincidence that the timing worked out this way at this time in my life when I finally, within myself, got the message from our guest and started putting her advice into practice in real life so that I could be an example and a testament to exactly what she's teaching today. Have you heard that doctors receive less than 20 hours of nutrition training in total during medical school in the US? Well, today's guest, who has been my doctor for the last almost six years, is a physician with a passion for nutritional science that defies the statistic and has dedicated her entire life to helping all of us understand the importance of and dispel the myths around nutrition, and more specifically, dietary protein. Dr. Gabrielle Lyon began her path by studying nutritional science and then decided that she wanted to go above and beyond food alone, keeping those principles with her, but deepening her training and mastery by going to medical school. She then completed two years of training in psychiatry, three years of family medicine, and after becoming board certified, added an additional postdoc in nutritional sciences, geriatrics, and obesity medicine. During this postdoc, she was mentored by one of the leading researchers in protein metabolism, Donald Lehman, and worked on a human study that combined obesity research with cognitive testing to understand how obesity and its resulting consequences, such as insulin resistance, affect the brain and contribute to cognitive decline. She will tell you herself how one participant in this study broke her heart and changed her life forever, setting her on a mission to prevent as many people as possible from needlessly suffering again. Today, she practices what she has coined muscle-centric medicine after realizing that we've gotten it wrong all of these years. The one thing that all of those people with cognitive decline in her study had in common wasn't that they were all obese. It was that none of them had muscle. She is committed to shifting our paradigm of healing chronic disease and optimizing human health from the obesity paradigm to the muscle paradigm. And she's going to explain to us today why muscle is about so much more than fitness or looking good in a bikini. And she's gonna explain why muscle isn't just for bodybuilders or fitness enthusiasts alone. It's for humans, for women like you and me, it's important for us to start building right here and now at any age so that we can reverse and prevent chronic disease processes. She's going to cover how muscle improves metabolic markers that are relevant to insulin resistance, type two diabetes and PCOS because skeletal muscle is our primary site for disposing of the carbohydrates that we eat. She's going to explain how this ties into the picture of preventing or delaying Alzheimer's, which we know is often called type 3 diabetes of the brain. She'll talk about why Alzheimer's starts 20 plus years before it actually presents and is a disease of midlife, not old age, plus what you can do now in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Why muscle is an endocrine organ that is just as important as your thyroid and produces biochemistry altering compounds, just like the thyroid produces hormones how muscle is essentially alive and how it's a nutrient sensing organ quite literally senses the amino acids that we eat in our diets. She'll explain what protein threshold you need to be meeting per meal to build muscle, the difference between plant and animal proteins in terms of amino acid quality, why leucine is the most important amino acid and why we need more of it as we age, how much protein you should be eating based on your body weight, how hormone changes such as menopause affect this picture, why body composition matters and how excess adipose tissue affects your brain and exactly what you can start doing today to become healthier, sharper, and hormonally optimized as you age. I always tell Dr. Lyon that she quite literally saved my life. The fact that I was able to receive this information from her now has allowed me to have a much better chance at my future when it comes to the Alzheimer's disease that runs in my family, the, the thing that I see day in and day out that is heartbreaking that so many people deal with in their families. She got me to see that I can go to the gym, even if that felt scary at first. I can build muscle and that it is my best shot at a healthy brain as I age, putting the power back in my hands. She's breaking the stigma of just losing weight on the scale and teaching human beings everywhere that muscle is what we need to focus on empowering them with the tools. She's breaking the stigma of traditional weight loss, fad diets, and focusing on obesity and teaching us all how to optimize our muscle, 
our hormones and live fuller, happier, healthier lives. Allow me to introduce one of my favorite humans on planet Earth, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, to What's the Juice. Enjoy. Okay, are you ready? Stay What's the juice? We just live with emotion and passion and fire. Tune in to our body. It's really powerful. See, it's so loud. I can be who my soul would like to show up as. We want to go that extra mile as people connect in with their body. Feel empowered by our health. Thank you. I'm going to leave it there. Engage to react, to learn, to grow. And without further ado, let's get juicy. So... Quickly, let me just tell you, it's time to sign in. We like to get a little bit woo-woo on the podcast before we get into woo. the science. Okay. Do you know your sun, moon, and rising signs? Cancer, cancer. You have, what was your rising? Because you're cancer, sun. Aquarian? You probably are Aquarius rising. Okay. Oh, with your paradigm shifting mm. advice. Okay. I am so excited to have you on the show today because not only have you taken care of me for I think five, six years now. Um, but I very much know and believe that I would not be in the place that I'm in with my health at this time if it weren't for your medical care and guidance, but also your willingness to see me as the picture of health that you knew that I could be when mm -hmm. I didn't even know it. So thank you for that. And thank you for being here. Of course. Nick, <laughs> Nick would kill me if I didn't take care of you. So, uh. <laughs> But you're just a master at holding the vision. I walked into your office at I don't know. I was overweight. I didn't have muscle on me. I was having thyroid issues, all of these different things. And I think you said to me, oh, you're an athlete. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, what are you talking about? And you're like, you're an athlete. You're going to do this. You're going to lift weights one day. And I finally am. Um, but you just saw me at this place that like you saw my higher self. And I think that having a physician, a mentor, a friend, a partner, someone in your life that sees you that way allows you to step into it. And you've held that for me for so long and you never gave up on me. And I never will. <laughs> right. Uh, I think that you're right. A friend, mentor, physician should always see the best version of you yeah. and hold you accountable. Yes. I can't say that I was always soft and cuddly with you. Many times, perhaps I was, but always pushing you to the best version of yourself, which is exactly what someone in your corner should be doing and I think you also respected when I just couldn't see what I couldn't see yet mm -hmm. you were like okay <laughs> I'm just gonna give you the space to see it and and like one day and I've been texting you recently literally saying I finally get it yeah. and for some of us it just takes time and so I'm hoping that in today's episode we can almost walk people through the mental process of how I learned what I know now about muscle and protein from yeah. you and what I'm continuing to learn as your knowledge evolves as well. Yeah, I am so grateful to be here to share it because, you know, it's interesting. We think about all the stuff that we're doing. We think about all the things on the periphery, whether it's yoga or I don't know, uh, any of the other modalities, hot bubble baths, whatever it is that we're using. But the reality is when we think about the pinnacle of health, Mm -hmm. That pinnacle has to be related to skeletal muscle. And everything else that you use to get there is really just to leverage the muscle. Yes. I've started <laughs> thinking about self-care differently. You're yes. right. I, I love a bubble bath. But at the same time, if I'm not going to the gym and challenging mm -hmm. my muscles and actually keeping the tissue on me that's going to protect me as I age, am I really caring for myself the way I need to be? Not really. And all of that other stuff now can just support that muscle. I see it as a support system. But the muscle is the gold. Yeah. So let's talk about why. I can't wait. Yeah, yeah. Before we get into the nitty gritty, I just want the audience to get to know you a little bit because, again, you're a mentor to me, you're a role model, and I want them to hear about your journey. So let's start with the personal journey, then we'll get into the professional. But just on a personal level, did you always eat this way? Did you always know about muscle? How did you come to being of service in this way? I would say I started very early on. I graduated high school early. I graduated high school in three and a half years. And I moved in with my godmother, Liz Lipsky, mm -hmm. and I moved to Hawaii. I lived with her. And for those uh, listeners who don't know, she is a world-class PhD. She's a PhD in nutritional sciences and really at the cutting edge and had been at that time at the cutting edge of this concept of a food-based approach to healing. And from living with her, I started to see all these individuals come in and out of her office heal certain things within themselves. So from a very early age at 17, I realized the power of food. 
And what kind of diet did she prescribe? All kinds. Uh, depends on what they had, if they had cancer, if they just had irritable bowel, whatever it was that they needed. But I will say, looking back, she was probably not as high protein as she should have been. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which now... Uh, Arguably, she is. Of course, as we evolve in our thought processes, mm -hmm. as we treat patients, we evolve. But essentially, she opened your eyes to the power of exactly. using food exactly. as a part of that multimodality approach to healing the human body. Exactly. Okay. And I was very interested in fitness at that time as well. And, and really, those concepts, those fundamental concepts have never changed. So when did it click for you professionally? When did you say, yeah. okay, I want to become a physician and I also am going to practice muscle-centric medicine? <laughs> right, right. And also, how did your training as a geriatrician play a role in that trajectory? Yeah, it's interesting. People think that they're all different, but it's not actually all different. These uh, areas that I've studied are much similar than people would initially think. So after I moved back to the States, mm -hmm. right, the mainland mm -hmm. from Hawaii, I began studying nutritional sciences. So I went right into nutritional sciences with a minor in chemistry. I thought I was going to be a registered dietitian. Mm. I don't know if you know that. Did you know that? No, but okay. it makes sense with how passionate you are about food. You're yep. one of the only physicians I've ever met that is like food, food, yeah, food. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you also know me personally, and I would say that my biggest fear in life is to not be of service or to be useful. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we all have fears, and, and that's arguably one of my biggest. I went to the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. And I don't know if you know, but that's like tornado world. And I was sitting in nutrition class, and there was a tornado. And we all had, whether it was a tornado warning or if it was like a real tornado, we were down in this fallout shelter for like two hours. And I was sitting there thinking, oh, my God, I'm – like going to school to be a dietitian, and I'm sitting in what potentially could be an emergency situation and I can do nothing. And it was at that moment I decided to go to medical school. Wow. <laughs> wow. So that you could just kind of do patch everybody what, up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so that was initially the thought was I love nutritional sciences. Yeah. I need to be able to be more useful, not saying that the dietetics sphere isn't useful, yeah. but for me, I wanted to be able to work with my hands. I wanted to be able to function in the case of an emergency. Yeah, and be able to to help guide someone as what to do in every area of their Absolutely. health if something's going wrong, not Absolutely. just in the food space. But it's nice that you've kept the food as a main part of your ethos. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, so then I decided, well, I, I'm going to obviously go to medical school. And I went to medical school following medical school, which, by the way, I hated. So, really? Oh, Yeah. I really was so interested in preventative care and medical school is very necessary. It's, it, you know, there's a certain level of mastery that happens yeah. with the kind of knowledge that you acquire, but it's a lot of pathology and it's not a lot of what can go right. It's a lot of what can go wrong, which is incredibly valuable. However, for me, I just found it very, um, like there's the medical student syndrome. Have you ever heard of that? No. <laughs> It's where you're a medical student and you literally get everything that you read about. Oh. So you don't actually get everything <laughs> you read about. You know, one day it's lupus and the next day it's ankylosing spondylitis, which is like mostly men, but doesn't matter. It could even be prostate, even if you're a female, like whatever. Yeah. These are really bad mom jokes, but you get the, the, uh, get the gist of where I'm going. Yeah. And I just found it really cumbersome and difficult. Yeah. But yeah. one of the, the amazing things is that you learn the pathology and as you go through medical training, you do learn algorithms. Mm -hmm. And those algorithms provide you with a capacity to think and a framework to think about things. Mm -hmm. And that's very valuable. Um, so after medical school, I did two years of psychiatry, which I think that you know. Yeah. Two years of psychiatry at the University of Louisville. Found out that that wasn't really for me. And then I did three years of family medicine. And during my time in family medicine, I was still doing uh, and involved in fitness and nutrition. Then I did a postdoc, which is after you're a board certified physician, you go back for additional training mm -hmm. in nutritional sciences, geriatrics, and obesity medicine at WashU. Wow. And how did that experience yeah. paint your current way of practice? That was the most, that was one of the most critical experiences. Basically, I was very interested in this muscle um, as. Uh, a pinnacle, but I didn't really understand why. And can you just tell us really quickly what is a geriatrician for yeah, those who don't yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a geriatrician specializes in someone over the age of 65. It's really looking at end-of-life care. And I should mention that while I was in my undergrad, I was trained and am still mentored 20 years later, much like I will do for you. <laughs> um, you know, if Nick doesn't kick me out. But uh, <laughs> by the way, he's sitting over there. Um, just so, looking at you with yeah, yeah. a smiling face in adoration. <laughs> <laughs> and 
my mentor is Dr. Donald Lehman. Yeah. And for the individual who doesn't know who that is, he is a world-leading expert in protein metabolism. Mm. Many of the concepts that we're going to discuss today were discovered in his lab. And that is incredible. And he's mentored me for over two decades. And that really shaped my conceptual understanding of protein and muscle. But the lights didn't really go on until I did my fellowship. And uh, where that really took shape was when I was doing obesity research, actually. So I was doing obesity research combined with um, cognitive testing. So looking at the way body weight plays into cognitive function. And this was in a lab you were doing this research? This was with, so th- that's a great question. This was actually with human participants. Wow. And it was a very large study and there were multiple arms to this study. And my project, as a postdoc, you have a project, my project was looking at the potential for insulin resistance in the brain and body weight. Which is what we're hearing about now with something like Alzheimer's where they call right. it type 3 diabetes of the brain. Exactly. So you were looking to find out, does that actually exist? I was looking to see from my perspective how their cognition changes and how early can we detect it. Wow. And where the concept of muscle-centric medicine and and the kind of medicine that that I practice now really happened because I became very attached to some of the participants. Yeah. And I feel and I felt at the time very responsible for their health or lack of health. Mm -hmm. And there was one participant who was a mom of three, always put herself last, and she had struggled her entire life with this yo-yo dieting effect of weight. Always struggled with the last 15, 20 pounds, was told to, you know, lose weight, go on Jenny Craig, Mm -hmm. do your walking, all the things that kept her in a cycle, uh, essentially a cycle that was destroying her. Yeah, because you're losing weight in these Jenny Craig or Weight Watchers models and you're not preserving muscle mass so you're actually ending up in a worse place which we'll talk about but absolutely she was in this cycle yes absolutely and it was a really disempowering message yeah of just restriction and totally yep and I imaged her brain and her brain looked like Swiss cheese and it looked like an Alzheimer's brain Wow. So and you can see that on you can. a screen. You can see components of it on an fMRI study. Wow. That combined with some of her cognitive testing that we were doing and her blood markers was just It was a precursor or premonition to what I had imagined her life was going to look like. And how old was she? Oh, gosh. She must have been in her early 50s, somewhere in her 50s. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I'd failed her. I actually felt personally responsible. Even if I had just met her, it was a failing of the medical narrative Mm -hmm. of let's just focus on obesity. There was no conversation about muscle. And after seeing all these patients over the years, I realized that the thing that they really had in common wasn't that they were all obese. Mm. That was an afterthought. It was yes. that they, none of them had muscle or they had muscle that was impaired. Yet the current paradigm of thinking was perpetuating this obesity epidemic, which an epidemic is something that kills people quickly. Yeah. Not a slow death, mm-hmm. you know? I don't know if you know this, but I started going to Weight Watchers when I was in sixth grade with my mom I did not know that yeah in sixth grade my mom because she was in this perpetual cycle of Jenny Craig Nutrisystem Weight Watchers all of this and so in sixth grade I was overweight I think I was like maybe like 165 or 170 pounds in sixth grade and um she's like okay you're coming to Weight Watchers with me and it was just kind of like come along for the cycle because it was all she knew right And our audience listening at home right now, I'm sure you guys know about my mom's situation. She now has late stage Alzheimer's and her story sounds so much like this patient that you saw in your study. Yeah. And if I had kept on that trajectory of just, you know, eating in this restrictive way where you're just trying to lose pounds on the scale and you're paying zero attention to muscle, I fear that I would be on the same trajectory as my mom. And that is one of my biggest motivators as to why I'm now finally getting it with muscle and protein and why I'm eating the way I am. And it's amazing the results that I'm seeing. So I want to talk about um, why, because I think this story about this relatively young uh, participant in her 50s paints a picture of why you now share this education day in and day out. And um, I would love to have the audience understand because a bulk of our audience is young women who are in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s and have an opportunity to make these changes now. Um, You once said to me that for every inch of your waistline that grows in your 20s and 30s, your brain actually (laughs) shrinks. So what is this relationship 
that you saw on these scans in mm-hmm. real life between poor metabolic health markers and low muscle and then the brain? Yeah, um, that's a great question. One of the things that we have to consider and think about is body fat Mm -hmm. and muscle mass. And where do those sit on the continuum for health and wellness? Mm. And one of the things that we know is excess adiposity or excess fat is a negative. Mm -hmm. And especially if it's around your belly, right? So this would be called visceral fat. And visceral fat functions a bit differently. It's the fat around the organs and it can be very inflammatory. Mm -hmm. So when you think about a low weight, uh, you know, a smaller waistline, you're essentially thinking about low visceral fat. And uh, maybe perhaps there's a correlation to low overall fat. Mm -hmm. And you want that. Yeah. So your waistline, you know, as we see an increasing in waistline, we do see a correlation to declining brain volume. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. And the waistline is almost just like a metabolic marker. It is a that's a that is it a metabolic marker. Yes, it is one measurement tool Mm -hmm. that can be very valuable. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people say that your your waist-hip ratio makes a difference, which I think is very valuable, and that your waist should be one half your height. But essentially, as you start to put on muscle, your body becomes a lot better at processing food and calories, and you sort of naturally begin to lose some of that excess fat. I think that that is an interesting question. So as you become healthier, as you put on more muscle – And let's say that it's healthy muscle, Mm -hmm. you absolutely will increase, number one, overall fitness, health and wellness. So muscle, as we're going to talk about, is so much more than just fitness. Yeah. Yes. Do you improve metabolic markers? Absolutely. And for the listener, if we were to say, okay, what is a specific metabolic marker? We would say muscle is the primary site for glucose disposal, Mm -hmm. right? And glucose is the carbohydrates that you eat. So where are you going to store those carbohydrates? You're going to, the goal would be to put them in your muscle, Mm -hmm. right? Because blood- If they don't go in your muscle, they go into your bloodstream. (laughs) And that's not good, right? (laughs) high blood sugar. And that's the definition of diabetes over a period of time is Mm -hmm. elevated blood sugar. Yeah. The healthier your muscle, I like to think about muscle as kind of the suitcase. Mm -hmm. And so when you're eating, you have to push it somewhere. Mm. And the place in which you'll you'll push it will be glycogen. Mm -hmm. And glycogen would be the storage form of glucose. Very, very valuable for, you know, and this is really important for the listener now. Yeah. Um, You know, in terms of your demographic, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, I like to think, and, you know, maybe you'll uh, humor me and let me tell you my third model of obesity. So I have a third model of obesity that people don't talk about. Mm -hmm. So when the listener is thinking, okay, well, what are these models of obesity? There's calories in, calories out. And there's the carbohydrate insulin model. Mm -hmm. And I believe there is a muscle centric model to obesity. And when you think about that, you have to think about skeletal muscle as your protection and place for what you're eating. Wow. Yeah. So it kind of eats what you're eating. Your yeah, muscle. that's actually a great way to, to – <laughs> you got to put it somewhere. Yes. And when you are thinking about overall health and you are thinking about avoiding Alzheimer's, avoiding diabetes, avoiding insulin resistance, you know, I believe that the primary site is really in skeletal muscle. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't mean to oversimplify it. Yeah. When you think about Alzheimer's, there's obviously a genetic component. There's mm-hmm. a vascular component. There, and, you know, that's to say that there are other forms of cognitive impairment, which mm-hmm. just means, you know, memory deficits. I don't want to oversimplify it. But these are the things that you can ha- you have direct control over, which yeah. is skeletal muscle. Yeah. So on a biological level, the way that muscle now in yeah. our 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s Critical. protects us against cognitive decline later in life is because of that disposal site of carbohydrates it's and calories. It's one major, major site. Okay. And then the other thing is when we think about the diseases of Western society, we really have to think about insulin resistance at the core. Mm-hmm. And for the listener, insulin is a peptide hormone that's released from the pancreas, and its job is to move blood glucose into cells. Mm-hmm. And if you are insulin resistant, you get things like obviously elevated levels of insulin, Mm -hmm. elevated levels of blood sugar, Mm -hmm. and all these diseases that go along with it. Or there's the potential for all these diseases like diabetes. Or PCOS. Or PCOS, right? The the huge majority over, gosh, I think it's 75% of individuals with PCOS have insulin resistance. Would you say PCOS? is a skeletal muscle muscle issue? I believe that PCOS has a component of it depending on the kind, right? So mm-hmm. we don't know exactly. I'm sure there's a, there is a genetic component. Mm-hmm. But I would say for individuals who are obese, 
I would say that skeletal muscle, that PCOS has definitely a skeletal muscle component. You once said to me that adipose tissue or excess fat on the body yeah. produces inflammatory cell signaling molecules right. like adipokines, right? And that muscle actually produces anti-inflammatory molecules like myokines, right? Mm -hmm. And that is something that's stuck with me for so long. So can you explain to us how these different tissues that we put on the body, depending on our diet and activity, actually affect our inflammation levels? Yeah. This is a critical point that you bring up. And actually, we often, I think, in social media, think about things in isolation. Mm -hmm. We'll think about the liver. I mean, I don't know if people think about it, but maybe. I, mean, I, I do. Think <laughs> Liv does. Um, you'll think about liver, you'll think about adiposity, you know, adipose tissue, fat tissue, or you think about skeletal muscle. But there's an interplay between the two. There's a crosstalk mm. that happens. And each of these organs release things. And skeletal muscle is no different. When we think about what skeletal muscle does, oftentimes we fall back on this concept of fitness and activity and training. But skeletal muscle is an endocrine organ. Mm meaning when you contract it, it releases, um, you know, peptides and molecules, much like the adipokine mm -hmm. release counter, um, you know, regulatory cytokines. So muscles release these myokines. And for example, I'll give you one. And actually, we should probably talk about BDNF. Yeah. Um, but just as we think about inflammation, skeletal muscle, when you contract it through resistance exercise or cardiovascular activity, it releases myokines. Mm -hmm. And these myokines released from contracting skeletal muscle have a plethora of effects on the body, from brain health to liver to counter-regulatory inflammation, the yeah. immune system, all ways to counterbalance um, inflammation. It's funny. I once had a personal trainer say to me, oh, you know, as you start to build muscle and start to work out, it's normal to kind of get a cold in the beginning or something because your immune system is almost re-regulating itself. Hmm. So is there some sort of this immune protective action to muscle as well? I think that's a great question. Is Can I easily say that there is an immune protective mechanism? I would say yes, there is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there is, especially when you're training it, right? It allows you to combat low-grade inflammation. Mm -hmm. And not only that, not just from the contracting muscle, but also as your body composition exists, as you have improvements in body composition. And then even on a deeper level, when we think about the powerhouses of the cell, the mitochondria, we are thinking about exercise, how that plays a role in having more efficient and effective mitochondria. So muscle and fat are both alive, essentially. Yeah. And it's important to remember that fat is producing things, fat tissue, which Absolutely. also it's normal to have some fat on your body. Of course, it's not a bad thing. It has to produce those things. Mm -hmm. But muscle is also producing certain things. So it's this fine balance of how much and what ratio of molecules do you want these substances on your body to produce. Yeah. And that's where the conversation of body composition comes in. And I think this is so important for people to understand because it's something that took me personally a very long time to understand. I always thought of my body as I don't like the way I look, so I need to lose weight. And I always thought of weight as one thing. But when you look at the body as body composition, you see your weight, your mass as a ratio of fat tissue or adipose tissue mm -hmm. to lean muscle mass, skeletal muscle. Right. Often when we say that we want to lose weight, what we're really saying is, I want to have my clothes fit better. I want to have a nicer shape maybe. I want to see some of my muscles. I want to have some definition. We don't necessarily want to be smaller for many of us. And when you do start to change your body composition or that ratio, sometimes you don't see a big difference on the scale because you are recompositioning. You're replacing some of that fat with muscle tissue. And that's really the goal. And I think that's where we can bring a lot of balance to the conversation, which for a long time in society has just been be thin, lose weight, go on a restrictive diet. We're actually talking about body composition. So can you explain more about yeah. what body composition is and how to recomp? Well, I think you did a beautiful job <laughs> right then and there. I will say, though, there's um, a few nuances to this that I, I really want the listener to get. We definitely have a perspective of how much body fat could be detrimental for okay. a person, right? I was going to ask that. Yeah. What's the fine balance? Well, so in the literature, you would say, okay, well, it's 30%. Um, you know, if is it 25% body fat for a man, mm -hmm. and then that's pushing into more obesity, is it 30% for a woman body fat? And I would say, uh, obviously, it depends on the person. However, I would say that likely some of those markers are a bit forgiving, 
mm-hmm. and that perhaps we might push that to say 25 percent body fat for a woman mm-hmm. and even lower for a man again this is a difficult conversation to have because of course it depends on you know is that too lean for a particular woman is she having hormone imbalances those kinds of things however I think it's really important to understand that we're very generous with our body fat percentages. Yeah. And overall, most physicians and the medical community does not focus on skeletal muscle mass. Yeah. And in fact, there is not a great way to say, okay, Liv, you're, I don't know, 5'3 and 130 pounds, you should be X amount of skeletal muscle mass. Mm -hmm. We don't really have a great measurement for your potential. Yeah. So is that kind of looking at the person individual to individual and seeing where you can see a certain percentage of definition and saying like that, that looks good to me or is it I mean, I, uh, I, I hesitate um, to say, is that appropriate? Like, would that be a good measure? But why not? I guess I'm just kind of looking for the listener to be able to understand what their goal should be. Because again, I think for so long, the conversation around dieting and losing weight has been about getting to some goal weight number on a scale. And I think we need this shift in a paradigm of what are our new goals. Um, And the way that I've personally been tracking my process or my, my progress is through how much of my muscle can I see? I don't yeah. necessarily want to go two, three sizes down. If that happens, that's great. But right. how much of my actual muscle tissue can I see on my body? That's just what and, I want. And I love that. And there are ways that we can look at tissue. So there's the visual way, obviously. And then, you know, you've heard about the in-body, which yep. we used to do in my office all the time. And people will do a DEXA. That's another great way to look at body composition. And also tracking your progress mm-hmm. in terms of how much muscle mass and then strength. Yes, strength and things or even endurance types type of activity these things are really critical there is something called an appendicular skeletal mass index which i actually you know i have a book coming out in september which is so long but we put together a chart in terms of being able to calculate yourself you know where are you in terms of skeletal muscle mass yeah it's um the best that we could do with all the information out there Mm -hmm. and uh, i do think that that can be valuable but when you think about body composition you do want to think about your waist measurement your percent body fat your physical strength yeah and we could throw in uh you know how you look yeah i think aesthetic is a small part of the conversation and for some people might be more important than Mm -hmm. others but i i think we're kind of talking to the average listener who just wants to be healthy and just wants to know they're at a good place body composition wise um and i think it's a tough conversation because People are very sensitive to it. And again, society has been very restriction focused for a long time. And while you do bring this new lens to the conversation of instead of taking away, let's put on muscle mass, there is also this body composition element where we can't deny the fact that excess adipose tissue, which varies person to person, can be metabolically harmful, perhaps cognitive health wise harmful. Absolutely. 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 It's just a truth. And it's, it's very difficult to kind of dance around that and I'm not saying that anybody has to fit a beauty standard or a certain size or anything like that I think we're just trying to say that well it's a personal responsibility to be as healthy as you possibly can because as your listener (laughs) is in their 20s and 30s that is the key you know Alzheimer's doesn't begin in your 50s that's important to say yeah can you explain that? yeah Alzheimer's does not begin in your 50s yeah these are diseases of middle age wow how early (sighs) 30s? Depends on how long you've been obese for. Wow. But we know that, you know, again, insulin resistance can be seen in 18-year-olds that are sedentary. Mm. There's no such thing as a sedentary healthy person. Wow. And these concepts and these ideas that um, that all of a sudden you hit 40 and you have X, Y, and Z, or you hit 50 and you have X, Y, and Z, no, my friend, these diseases of aging started when you were in middle age, Is if it- not earlier. Is it true that our metabolism slows down as we age or is it just that we become more sedentary and lose it's muscle mass? It's that you become more sedentary and you lose muscle mass. But if you buy in the par- you know, if you buy into that paradigm of thinking, you'll likely do less. Huh. You know, these things I have super fit older women yeah. and super fit older males. Yeah, we see that it's possible. It's but it is uncommon. Yeah. And if you are going to be the exception to the rule, then you're going to have to have uncommon disciplines. And I think you're also going to have to start now, essentially, wherever you are right now listening to uh, yes. this. I think that that's where the, the misconception of your metabolism slows down as you age comes from, because it's simply the longer that you go, yes, the older that you get from the point where you stopped taking fitness seriously, 
the harder it is because you have more body recomposition to accomplish. You do, and your hormones have changed. So, mm-hmm. you know, when you're young in your 20s and 30s, your hormones are at a peak. Your growth hormone is at is it at a peak? It's definitely higher than it will be in your 50s. Yeah. But you are and can be driven by hormones. And I will tell you this that strength gains during adolescence and in that the you know, the puberty phase is critical. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. I always think about Nick's body composition yeah. and how he's able to maintain his muscle mass so he easily. He was probably super active when he was younger. He was lifting at 13. That's why. <laughs> this kid was <laughs> his uncles had him lifting weights when he That's was incredible. Young. I actually just interviewed a PhD. His name is Samuel Samuel Buckner, and uh-huh. he is um, an expert in muscle physiology and what it means to build muscle. Huh. And I said, Sam, you know, well, everyone talks about grip strength. So grip strength, they say, is, is a marker for longevity. And he said, well, I think that we probably should con- reconsider that because you're born, you know, what grip strength you have, you're born with. Huh. And I was like, oh, really? That's kind of depressing. He's like, yes, but where you can really move the needle is when you are younger in adolescence and the more active you are, you build on this natural strength. And that natural strength is more important than the hypertrophy that you would potentially put on later. And so when you are then moving from adolescence to adulthood, Mm -hmm. it's the natural strength that you've put on when you were younger and active that's actually even more critical. I was just saying to Nick, thank God I went to Planet Fitness for like six months when I was 18 because that must have given me some kind of <laughs> That is memory. hilarious. That is hilarious. <laughs> um, and that uh, while you can focus on hypertrophy, really you have an opportunity. And listen, is is it a hard, you know, is it a hard stop when you're no longer in puberty? Probably not. Um, yeah. You can definitely make improvements. At any to, age. We, we know that you can always make improvements. Yeah. But, you know, the younger listener here has an opportunity. And you also have an opportunity to set you set you up for optimal aging because I'm telling you, it goes by – it goes fast, man. So essentially, if you – I'm sure that no one listening right now is in adolescence. Maybe you are. God bless. To start working out. But I'm sure that you're probably not. Get it together, not. people. <laughs> um, but Push-ups. if you are not in adolescence and you're in young adulthood or adulthood or well into middle age, no matter what, if you start now, the earlier you start, the better. And you can just continue to build on those strength gains yeah, as you age. It, it doesn't get – and you have to continue to do it. Listen, um, I, I want to – how do I say this? No plan survives contact with the enemy. No plan survives contact with the enemy. What does that mean? That means it's not if, it's when there's yes. going to be a critical moment in your life. It's not Which we saw if, with COVID. It's That's not such a good if, example. It's when that there will be a contact with the enemy. Wow. What are you going to do? So there's you really have one of two choices. One, you just go about your life and your fitness is secondary and you you know you're young and you look good so you don't really have to be fit. Mm-hmm. Or you train for when those things happen. Yeah. Before they happen. Wow. And I know that that's pretty deep and people are like, "Wow, that's a little morbid." But um, again, you must train and plan for the inevitable and hopefully the inevitable never comes Mm -hmm. but it does yeah and the stronger that you are the fitter that you are the more capacity you have to survive anything yep yep whether a biological agent or whatever run from something whatever it is stress exactly yeah and even on a day-to-day basis how do you keep muscle healthy you know you obviously train Mm -hmm. and you have a diet that's going to support that so for someone who maybe doesn't necessarily want to lose weight or they have a sensitive history around there. Is it a is it better than nothing for someone to just put on muscle mass regardless of actually losing fat? Or do you need totally. to put on muscle mass and lose fat? I think that there is a recomposition that happens. Okay. Naturally. Uh, yeah. As a effective protein prioritization, which we'll talk about. <laughs> protein prioritization, <laughs> probably moving from uh, less active to more active. Yeah. Again, body composition or weight doesn't necessarily need – or I should say weight doesn't need to be the, the focus. Yeah. One individual could also focus on strength. Yeah. And becoming stronger. So will that strength in and of itself change body composition? Uh, Maybe, maybe not. But again, if your calories are in check, right, you can't just have a Twinkie diet and assume you're going to out train the Twinkie diet. I mean, you can, but that's a lot of training. Yeah. (laughs) Um, My husband's listening is probably like, oh, yes, I can eat those (laughs) pancakes under the table. No, honey, that's not what I'm saying. Um, Yeah, I I think that being able to focus on proper dietary habits 
And it doesn't, again, you don't have to focus on losing weight, but you do have to focus on being responsible. Yes. And with that responsibility comes eating in a way that cares for yourself Mm -hmm. and moving and training in a way that at times maybe a little annoying or uncomfortable Mm -hmm. or you just want to hang out on the sofa and eat bonbons, but it's probably not going to be uh, cardio protective or (laughs) protective from a a cognitive aspect. Yeah, I just think the cultural pendulum naturally swings from extremes at times. Mm -hmm. So we had kind of the Jessica Simpson era of restrictive diets in the 2000s that were, again, thin thin was the standard. (laughs) Did we? I totally missed that. And then now the cultural pendulum has swung to more of this body acceptance model and um, even the fat acceptance model. And then I think there is this middle ground balanced conversation where Mm -hmm. I'm trying to explain to people and you're trying to explain to people of, yes, calories matter. Yes, adipose tissue matters. Yes, you don't want to have excess adipose tissue. There is an actual effect of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. No matter where you are right now, all you really need to focus on is upping your protein and building muscle. And as those things happen, as you become metabolically healthier because of that, Mm -hmm. you may see fat loss as a result of it. You may want to have an you know endeavor yeah, upon that absolutely but all you really need to do right now is start strength training and eating protein you don't have to think about the restrictive nature or the calories or the weight or the fat I think that that is very empowering for people and we know that you can move the needle in terms of um, metabolic bio you know metabolic markers without weight loss mm-hmm. so exercise in and of itself can actually affect triglycerides can affect HDL can affect insulin can affect glucose regardless of weight loss. And can affect your brain in the BDNF conversation because the contraction of especially skeletal muscle in the legs, right, actually boosts your brain's, essentially your brain's growth hormone, right? Yeah. And I mean, these are really incredible things that people can do if an individual is, you know, has a sensitivity around um, weight and, and things of that nature. However, I will say that wherever a person is, it's their responsibility to be the best version of themselves. Yes. And that best version of themselves may require a little bit of tough love with themselves. Yeah. And I think a lot of this, um, you know, again, cultural swing to let's just be accepting and neutral and not try to change anything and not be restrictive, I think comes from people who have things like PCOS and metabolic disorders not having the right answer, which is muscle, for a long time. So it kind Mm -hmm. of comes to this place of helplessness of, fine, I just give up. I'm just going to accept myself as is because I don't see a viable answer. I can't lower my calories any further. Mm -hmm. Like, again, Weight Watchers tells me to. I can't live this way. I don't want to restrict. It's bad for my mental health. So I'm just going to accept things. But there really is this middle ground of becoming metabolically healthier through muscle that gives way to a world of possibilities again. And I want people who are listening who have PCOS and insulin resistance to know that you absolutely can change your body composition. And it starts with hopping your protein absolutely, and lifting some heavy things. Crazy, right? It's not that hard. <laughs> yes. I just made a reel about this the other day on Instagram of all the things I wish I knew or yeah. essentially wish I understood because you told them to me for years. But I said, I look, insulin does matter, right? It does make it harder to lose weight at times. Of course. Because you're hungrier or you have more cravings or your blood sugar is not as stable. So you're on a, on a roller coaster and you want sugar all the time. Um, and when you have things like insulin resistance, you might also have other hormones that are high, like ghrelin, right? Where you're hungry mm-hmm. all the time. You don't have the same satiation signals. And other hormones like cortisol that you hear about or estrogen dominance, those matter too. They can make you put on weight in other areas of your body that you didn't used to put on weight when you were a kid. But I used to see them as, oh, I can't lose body fat because I'm a little insulin resistant or because I'm estrogen dominant. And that's not the case. The hormones are part of the picture, but I think we've lost sight of the core and the foundation, which is the muscle. Absolutely. I love that you're bridging this conversation. Where I believe that this conversation is right now is that we have fitness professionals, which Mm -hmm. I actually believe are the key to health and wellness. So we have the fitness professionals and then we have the medical community. Mm. And they're really in two separate camps. And then we have the holistic community that's like, it's just your insulin resistance. Totally. Balance your blood sugar and you'll lose weight. And that's not true either. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, Yes. So that is absolutely correct. And we're right now, um, you know, you've got like the CrossFitters and the heavy lifters and that that's like one camp. Yeah. And then you have the medical community, which, you know, we know that where they stand. And then, of course, like you said, the more holistic is, you know, it's all about your it's hormones. It's all about hormones. Right? 
And the reality is the real magic is going to be bridging the gap. Yes. It's somewhere in the middle. The truth is always in the middle. And we must understand that muscle is medicine. Mm -hmm. And if we can bridge the gap and not look at muscle as it relates to a performance fitness aspect and really about how it's an endocrine organ, just as important as the thyroid, just as important as the heart, it, it is an endocrine organ. Yeah. If we can shift that conversation and understand that it's at the core of everything related to health and and fitness, then the conversation will start with muscle, not be an afterthought of working out, right? Yeah, muscle is actually the solution. Exactly. Yeah. What else could you – I mean, it's not like you can go exercise your liver. I mean, I guess if you're going binge drinking or something, (laughs) maybe. But the reality is uh, skeletal muscles is under voluntary control. For someone who's, who's saying, okay, well, what's skeletal muscle? It's, again, the muscle that's under voluntary control. You actually have within your possibility a way to move an organ system in uh, an effort that you see fit. Wow. It's funny because we'll take turmeric to lower our inflammation, but don't think about building muscle to release how about anti-inflammatory a, myokines. Exactly. Or how about doing a session of high-intensity interval training? Yes. Yeah. Or we'll take a supplement to help our thyroid, exactly. but we won't put on muscle, which will help our thyroid. So it's I just want people to see muscle as the best supplement that you can take. But it's interesting because unlike everything else, exercise is the one thing that nobody else can do for you. So nor should they. It's it's amazing that you yeah. have to actually overcome the friction and put yeah. in the effort to do it for yourself. Yeah. How amazing is that? Yeah. It's much easier to do what you said, like do the other things that take turmeric or, or do whatever and all that stuff's great. But the reality is, um, you know, humans were designed to thrive under stressful situations. Yeah. And yes. And we take ourselves out of them. Totally. We try to make oh, life we're gonna really de- easy. Right. And so that is not actually how we were designed to function. Yeah. We were designed for hard things. We were designed for effort. We were designed to lean into the challenge. You know, and I, I won't get off on a, a tangent, but I might for 30 seconds, is that we're constantly told about fight or flight mm-hmm. and that that is the stress response. Girl, that is only one stress response. Because of you, we interviewed Kelly McGonigal, I mean, Outside of Stress. There you so go. please refer to that episode. I'm going to put it in the show notes. Stress is actually a signal that the moment in front of you matters. That is what Kelly says. Exactly. It's not always a bad thing. And it's not even a bad thing. It's, Are you kidding? It's all about how you interpret it. It's and, how you respond. Uh, again, it's a paradigm, a way of how, you know, a paradigm is really just a construct that we made up. Mm-hmm. There's a paradigm of obesity, which yeah. is how we're all functioning. And that's really just a construct. That over a period of time, people have decided that that's the construct they're going to follow. Yep. The same thing with stress. And the reason I bring in stress is because people have a tendency to shy away from the difficult physical thing. Like you had mentioned, nobody can do it for you. Yeah. And nobody should do it for you. Mm-hmm. Skeletal muscle is really at the key. It is the organ of longevity. And it's going to determine nearly everything about how you age. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, what's so amazing is aside from you know, your mind – your body is a tool. Yeah. Like your mind can be the weapon and your body is the tool. Mm-hmm. How are you going to leverage that? Yeah. I think to your point of all the separation where there's the fitness professionals and the CrossFitters here and the doctors here and the holistic group here, sometimes for just the average person listening, that responsibility of needing to go to the gym and exercise the muscle yourself can feel like a, a break in identity, right? It can feel like, oh, but I'm not that CrossFitter. I'm not that fitness professional. And I think for so long, just speaking personally, that's why you told me to go to the gym and lift for five years and I just started going because- <laughs> I cannot believe you just started going. I mean, look, I, I, I told you I did my walks and Pilates. I was working my way up, which I'm grateful for. I think going from absolutely sedentary for me to lifting felt- Re- like really difficult and um, discouraging for whatever reason. Not to say you can't do yeah. that, but I almost needed kind of like the confidence, the momentum, even just like the structural and posture help from like walking first and then doing the Pilates. All of those things played a role in my journey. And, and they all matter. So all of those things matter. The yeah. walks, the Pilates, it all matters. Yes. It's all ways to leverage muscle. And you also pr- begin and now are in a position where you're proving to yourself that you can do it. And, yes. and I do think that perhaps for certain age groups, it's again, it's a little intimidating to yeah. do lift, to, to go and lift weights or and do for women, I think yeah. that was my thing. It was, I felt silly walking up to a rack of free weights, picking them up. And I thought, okay, all the guys are going to be looking at me and thinking about how terrible my form is. So 
That, Which, uh, by the way, no guy is thinking that. But I will say that those are very real barriers. And I don't know. I started working with someone on Zoom mm-hmm. who could help with my form. And then I also asked Nick for help with my form. So I don't know if if I didn't have a fitness professional over Zoom telling me, okay, do these four exercises when you go to the gym on day A and these four when you go to the gym on day B, if I would have felt like I could walk into a gym and actually do them. So there is, to your point of fitness professionals being the future, I think that we need that support and that help. And again, for so long, we've been putting our dollars towards programs like a Weight Watchers and spending there versus spending on a fitness professional who can help you, who you relate to, who you feel safe with, who can explain these exercises to you so that you don't feel silly walking into a gym. And that, I think, was what changed the most for me. Hmm. You know, I have been training for a very long time. I still hire a trainer. I still have professional input. Yeah, yeah. Still to this day. Yeah. And I think people also, that's obviously a financial barrier, especially if you're doing a one-on-one personal trainer. Obviously, that's not accessible to everybody. Mm -hmm. But there are programs online. There are even YouTube videos that you can look to. I think um, Andrew Huberman just interviewed someone who has YouTube videos Mm -hmm. of like how to do a cable row properly. You can look up these things online for form. Pick four exercises, right? Like memorize those YouTube videos of how to do them, go into the gym, or mm-hmm. work with a fitness professional that's at a price point, maybe a group class, something like that, totally. that's showing you how to do things. And there's a lot of, you know, here's what I found. I've been in practice for quite some time. People, they either find a way or they find an excuse. Mm-hmm. And I know that that sounds a bit intense, but it's true. You're either going to find a way or you're going to find an excuse. And what I hope that this episode does for people is it really allows them to find a way. Yeah. Because it's very rare in medicine that we say, if you do this one thing, mm. just if you do this one thing, your capacity to improve nearly all cause mortality, nearly every domain of your health, is this one thing, which is exercise. Yeah. And having healthy skeletal muscle. Yeah. I mean, that's very unusual. Yeah. So it's like you have to find your way, whichever way that is. You have to. Yeah. It's critical. Yeah. Uh, you know, especially when we think about muscle as this organ of longevity, you do have to do resistance training and you do have to, you know, I, yeah. I'm sure that we're going to talk about, uh, you know, what are specific things that the listener can do. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I believe depends on a goal, right? Yeah. And throughout your life, you have perhaps different goals, but an individual should be training three to four days a week yeah. of resistance training. Mm-hmm. And so three to four days a week of resistance training, yeah. it's great to hit each muscle group twice. Um, you should also be doing some kind of cardiovascular activity. I wanted to talk about that in the lens of cognitive decline. So I'm going to ask you about aerobic versus resistance in a minute. But when you say that there's this one thing that everyone needs to do, which is um, exercise, right? There's actually two things that they need to do. It's true. One is exercise. Two is eat enough protein. It's true. So that that exercise actually has an effect on muscles. So let's talk about protein because it's my favorite topic. It really is the most overlooked macronutrient. We have the low fat diets of the 90s, the high fat keto diets of now. We talk about low carb, high carb, all of these these things. But Mm -hmm. protein is just left in the corner and people are afraid of it. So first of all, for the beginner who's listening and is like, I'm ready to go to the gym and build muscle and (laughs) recomp. What do I need to do diet wise to make that happen? What is your prescription for the absolute beginner? We know three to four times a week resistance training. Maybe you start with two to three times a week at the gym. Um, But we have the exercise part. Eating. How much protein should people be eating? Um, Well, again, there is the recommended dietary allowance. And then there is what I think is being shown to be more effective for individuals. And my baseline recommendation for anybody starting out is one gram per pound ideal body weight. That's what I was going to ask. Ideal body ideal weight. Ideal body weight. And you yes. can titrate up and you can titrate down. But again, this is for the listener. This is about making science and making nutrition accessible for people. Yes. And that is one gram per pound ideal body weight. So I'm 110 pounds. Let's say my ideal body weight is 110. I would have about that much protein. Mm-hmm. Easy. And I think that's a, a an easy equation for people to do because you hear, you know, figure out how much lean muscle mass you have and then eat a pound for – how do you figure that out? Most people don't have an in-body scan in their home. Right. So for someone who's listening – and then some people say one gram of protein per pound – of body weight in general. And that can be too much for someone who's 250 pounds. Exactly. So let's say you are 250 pounds. Your goal weight is 150 pounds. Easy. You eat 150 grams of protein. I love that equation. Thank you. It's easy, right? (laughs) So easy. And listen, someone could say so. And then there's a couple nuances, right? If you are young, 
then you probably can go less. Yep. But if you are older, you probably want to err on the side of more protein because you actually need more protein as you age versus less, I was which is ask totally that. different than what everybody thinks about. Yes. And, um, you know, why do you need dietary protein? Because you need it to build muscle. And not only that, it's not the, quote, dietary protein that you need. It's all the amino acids. There's 20 different amino acids for, you know, arguably 20 for humans. And we need all of them. And we're actually eating for those amino acids. Particularly, there's nine essential, which means we must eat them. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're, we're really looking for. Why is that? Because you said that to me recently. We were texting about protein and you said, yep, you're not just eating protein for protein. You're eating it for these amino acids that have dual roles. That's right. So <laughs> it's a great way for people to think about eating this chicken or beef on their plate. Oh, I'm actually eating these little gold nuggets of amino acids. And again, I always think about supplementation because I'm in the supplement industry. I think it's people feel like it's really easy for them to take a supplement. That's why it's so attractive. But as you eat chicken and beef, you are supplementing amino acids, right? Yeah. And they are medicinal in a sense, if you want to say it that way. So what are these dual roles that these amino acids give us? Well, number one, there again, there are 20 different amino acids and nine of which they're essential. And they all are unique in terms of their makeup. So for example, I'm very interested in the branch chain amino acids. Mm -hmm. And those are the leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Brand, and you know, we don't have to go into a biochemistry lesson, but <laughs> essentially the branch chain is what is, you know, what that looks like, mm -hmm. what that amino acid looks like. And we talk a lot about, well, you and I talk uh, a lot about leucine. And leucine is one of the essential amino acids. And it's a branch chain just because of the way that it looks, right? And that is essential for muscle protein synthesis. Mm. And there are other amino acids like arginine. Arginine is important for vasodilation, for mm. people with high blood pressure. Um, there's tryptophan, which is a precursor for serotonin. Mm. You know, uh, threonine is another amino acid, which, is a, which helps make mucin for gut health. Wow. So these amino acids, while I talk a lot about protein for muscle, mm. they all, nearly all have dual roles. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because, again, you can buy arginine in a supplement form. But you why can, not just eat it? Exactly. Yeah. You can get it on your plate. It's really a food as medicine conversation. And I'll mention to you, this is one of the reasons why I believe that we see differences in studies, efficacies of studies, because mm -hmm. it doesn't take into account the person's baseline protein intake. Huh. Do you also need these amino acids for liver detox pathways? You do. So is it fair to say someone who's getting adequate protein is going to have more efficient liver detoxification than someone who's not? Um, I would say yes. I think that that's tricky. You know, you're really talking about methionine and cysteine. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, your body does rely on these amino acids. Again, some are essential and some are non-essential and your body can generate their own. Yeah. But I would say yes, you, you do need dietary protein. Can it aid in detoxification based on those amino acids? Mm -hmm. Likely yes. Okay. So you just mentioned that women need more protein as they age, not less. And it's interesting because I opened up a question box on Instagram, had people write in what they wanted me to ask you. And a lot of women in their 40s and 50s said, I feel like this advice that you're giving and talking about is really applicable to young women in their 30s they and couldn't it doesn't be more apply wrong. to me. Yeah, yeah. Why is that? <laughs> What's the role of the hormone changes that we see in menopause, for example, in one's ability to gain and maintain muscle? And why does protein become more important? This is really, really, really important. Um, I believe that the decline in hormones, while it, it has the potential to make it more difficult to maintain muscle, it is not the only thing. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying here is that if women are in menopause, perimenopause or postmenopause, they still can maintain the muscle that they have, mm -hmm. regardless of hormone status. Amazing. It may be more difficult but hormone replacement is not necessary in that way. Mm -hmm. Again, this requires probably a lifetime of physical activity. This re requires really being tight on your diet. But, you know, it's not saying that, um, like, let's say there's an individual who doesn't want to be on hormones and now they've hit menopause and they're like, okay, well, is that just the end for me? And I would say that that's not true. Mm -hmm. Uh, hormones do change perimenopause, menopause, uh, and of course, menopause is de uh, defined as 12-month period with no period. Mm -hmm. 
And after that, an individual is considered to be in menopause. And this is obviously a decrease in estrogen, progesterone. And then, you know, testosterone uh, still has a tendency to stick around, but certainly it's not as robust as, you know, we've seen it in the past. Yep. But the reality is uh, you still can maintain and build muscle. Now, you asked another question is, what about dietary protein? This is where it becomes really important. As you age, muscle is actually a nutrient sensor. Mm. Muscle is, yes, an endocrine organ, the organ of longevity. It is also a nutrient sensing organ. Hmm. What does that mean? What does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad you asked me. Uh, skeletal muscle uh, senses amino acids. And the uh, efficiency to sense these amino acids, we'll just bring it back to leucine because that's the, the trigger for muscle protein synthesis, decreases. The sensing ability and efficiency of skeletal muscle as individuals age decreases. Wow. Guess what the way to overcome that is? To eat more of those amino acids. At one time, to then bring up the threshold of those amino acids to trigger this concept of muscle protein synthesis or this mechanism. I'm so glad that you brought up threshold because mm -hmm. my next question is, let's take menopause out of the, conver the conversation for right now yeah. and just talk about the average person. What is the threshold of protein that we need to be eating per meal to stimulate muscle protein synthesis? And furthermore, what is muscle protein synthesis yep. for those who don't know? Um, well, first of all, let's start with muscle protein synthesis. Mm -hmm. Muscle protein synthesis is kind of what it sounds like. It's a way in what the way that I think about it and what be relevant for the listener is a way to maintain muscle health. Okay. You want muscle to constantly be turning over and you want to be able to rebuild it. Mm. Muscle is not just a static... Uh, tissue. Hmm. One of the reasons, you know, when we think about insulin resistance and unhealthy muscle, it's because, you know, we've packed so much stuff into it, it ends up looking like a marbled steak. Really? Because of fat yes. being packed into yes. muscle? Yes. And so what you want is you want a flux. You want a flux of nutrients. You want a flux of fatty acids. You want a flux of glucose. That's one of the reasons why you want to leverage skeletal muscle. You want those nutrients to be moving. You don't want it to be, to be stagnant. And when you say muscle turnover, does it mean that your muscles have cell turnover the same way that your skin has cell yes. turnover? Uh, yes. Your body goes through, I want to say it's 250 grams of protein turnover a day. Wow. In all kinds of, uh, really, your, your cells are always turning over. So just to put this in perspective, we're putting expensive exfoliating <laughs> skincare, you know, like skincare yeah, yeah. products on our face to promote cell turnover on the face, but we should be doing the same with our muscles by eating enough protein to fuel that turnover. Yes. And when you hit, you have to understand is there's critical organs that the protein is always going to go to first, right? Okay. The body is going to maintain the heart and the liver before it's going to maintain skeletal muscle. Got it. And these tissues are always turning over, you know, for, you know, collagen may be slower, but they're, you know, tendons and, and collagen based things may be slower, but the tissue is always turning over mm -hmm. and protein turnover plays a role in your health and wellness in general. Um, so your question in terms of what is muscle protein synthesis, it really is a way in which when we look at the literature is it's a way in which we kind of measure the ability for hypertrophy or growing more muscle, muscle protein synthesis. And also, is it involved in the maintenance of muscle as well? It is. Okay. It is. So it's it's more of an indirect measure. It's kind of just the way in which it's done in the literature. But over a period of time, that's what we're looking at, muscle okay. protein synthesis. So every day we want to be stimulating muscle protein synthesis. Yes. Okay. Um, do you want to do it? Yes. Um, and the reason I look a little hesitant to say that is because the more you know, the less you speak in absolutes. Mm -hmm. And there is a period of time where depending, uh, which we can talk about, or people can actually listen to my podcast on protein restriction. Okay. A period of time where perhaps you're not wanting to pump the body with amino acids. So okay. there, there may be periods of time in life, you know how people talk about autophagy? Yes. There's ways in which there's a cellular, uh, kind of cellular mechanisms with protein that allows for them to regenerate and clean out older proteins. Okay. So that, for as an example, would that be for someone who has something like cancer or is that Potentially. Just, okay. Potentially. Or, yes, that's a good question. Or potentially protein restriction in very discreet periods of time. Okay. Okay. But for the 
average listener who currently wants to build muscle. Yes. It's safe and to say that. And maintain healthy muscle. Yes. Who's, who's in a building phase. Who's like, I'm ready to put on muscle. Yeah. It's safe to say that they would want to be stimulating muscle protein synthesis yes. every day. So let's talk about what that looks like. Okay. Because there's two ways to do that, right? There's two. Yes. <laughs> there's two ways to do it. And it is through dietary protein. Right. And it's at high, a certain threshold, at per a meal. Cert, which is about the high quality protein. Mm-hmm. Right. So, again, it's we base quality of protein. People get very emotional about protein quality. You know, uh, it's not really emotional. Yeah. In fact, it's not emotional. It is a hard, fast biological number. What is this amino acid versus this amino acid? Yes. There's nothing emotional about it. And it's the high quality protein because of the leucine content that stimulates muscle protein synthesis. Arguably, you need all those amino acids to lay down new muscle, right? And, you need all of them. And this is animal protein. Well, I mean, you could do it with plants, but again, you would mention PCOS. Yeah. If you're going to do it with plants, you have to understand you're going to be consuming a lot more carbohydrates. Yes. And a then, lot more carbohydrates and probably calories as well yeah. to hit the threshold of protein and amino acids exactly. that you need. So the question becomes, what is most important and what is most impactful for that one individual? Mm-hmm. So what's a strategy? Mm-hmm. How could someone get their one gram per pound of ideal body weight? I would say if someone is just looking to maintain their weight Mm -hmm. and not have any kind of change, they'll have two large meals Mm -hmm. and maybe a smaller meal in the middle, a smaller snack. So that first meal of the day, whenever they want to have it, should have between 30 and 50 grams of protein. Okay. And you're like, well, why is it? Why does that first meal matter? Mm -hmm. Because you're coming off of an overnight fast. Mm -hmm. And you might have your first meal at 11. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. But Mm -hmm. that first meal, your body is primed. And that's where 30 to 50 grams of protein at that first meal is very valuable. Okay. Okay. And this works for everybody. Um, It works for if you are perimenopause, menopause, this works. So your body is more primed to absorb the amino acids in that protein? It's more, um, is it, is it more primed to absorb it? I would say um, yes. And it's ready to be stimulated. Mm, Okay. It's ready to be stimulated because you're in a fasting because state. Because it hasn't had a stimulus exactly. for a while. Exactly. Got so it. now if you come in and, and you're like a heavy hitter, yep. you're going to hit a robust amount yep. and you're going to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. Just like when you haven't had sugar for a while, it tastes really sweet to you. So you haven't had <laughs> Oh, yeah, I know. I got into overnight. my kid's uh, <laughs> Halloween candy. I'm like, I cannot, but this tastes like gasoline and rubbing alcohol. This is horrible. <laughs> Um, it was terrible. Can't relate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I saw her first. She's got like a Halloween candy. Anyway. Um, Right. So that first meal of the day is uh, when you would really want to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. And also just understanding, again, is muscle protein synthesis the be-all end goal? Um, yes and no. But mm-hmm. what it also does is it sets you up for blood sugar regulation. You would, I was going to ask, yeah. yeah, why is that 30 to 50 grams of protein threshold for that first meal important? Is it for muscle protein uh, synthesis? Is it for blood sugar regulation for Mm -hmm. the full day? Or is it for satiation or a mix of all three? Are you ready? Yeah. When you feed for the needs of muscle, everything else falls into place. Mm, Love it. I target muscle because if people understand that that's the threshold to shoot for, everything else falls into place. Yes. Neurotransmitters, protein turnover. Cravings. There you go. Blood sugar regulation. But if I say, hey, do this, 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 and this, Forget it. But if I say, hey, we are going to prioritize the health of your skeletal muscle, everything else falls into place. It's funny. I tell people that my whole life, I always had this noise in my head. At the end of the day, I'd finish my last meal and there was this constant noise in my head. Go get a cookie. I need some chocolate. I need I need something sweet. I need more. I need more. And it was this voice that I, I just couldn't control myself. And it wasn't until I started truly hitting this 30 to 50 gram threshold per meal and 120 to 140 sometimes grams of protein per day because I'm in a caloric Mm -hmm. deficit so I need a little bit more protein that's right um gosh you're a good student you know me I've been listening to your (laughs) podcast I'll put a link below um but it wasn't until I actually hit these numbers of of eating sometimes three chicken breasts in a meal where I was like this is not what I was taught this seems crazy yada yada I did that and I've experienced brain silence for the first time in my life where I'm just satiated at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. I don't have that voice in my head that says I need to eat. I don't have that emptiness, that craving. It's just amazing that when you hit protein and you feed muscle to your point, Mm -hmm. everything else really does fall into place and you can have mental peace. I mean, there's this binge eating element here too that we need to talk about because of Mm -hmm. protein prioritization. So can you say a bit about that? Yeah. So basically um, you're bringing up two 
really important bodies of work. And number one, you're talking about protein leverage. Mm -hmm. And this was Steve Simpson, and he talked about something called the protein leverage hypothesis. Okay. And what that is, is that humans will eat to a certain amount of amino acid need, like a, a threshold, and they'll keep eating. So what does that mean? That means if you reduce your protein intake by just a few percent, you will continue to feed to try to get that up. And that feeding could be carbohydrates. It's actually one of the reasons why people think um, obesity took off uh, like hotcakes. No pun intended. That was a good mom joke. Um, is that the percentage of protein has decreased, but you know you can increase your total cal calorie drive more than 10%. Mm -hmm. So basically, in a nutshell, when your protein is low, you will be driven to feed. Mm. And you will keep feeding until you get those amino acids. And you will likely not be feeding on chicken breasts. Yeah. You will likely f be feeding on uh, highly palatable, palatable carbohydrates. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the other aspect of the thing that you're talking about in terms of cravings is this is a component of protein leverage. And it's also some of uh, Heather Lighty's work. Mm. And I, I think that she, she might be in Nebraska now. Maybe she's in Arkansas. Uh, she's probably not in either of those places. But, <laughs> uh, and what she showed was that individuals that had a high-protein breakfast were much less likely to have the brain reward pathways light up towards the end of the day. It's all about the damn brain reward pathways. It's so – I've been thinking about this so much the last two months as I've changed my diet in this way. It's amazing how much I was looking to food for a reward before. And I think that's also part of the issue here. And and the best way that I found to stop needing food to light up my brain and make me happy or stop needing as much stimulation in general is mm. to eat more protein. Yeah. I almost feel like my life got simpler because I'm not reaching for other stimulating things as much because I, my protein needs are met. Basically, what you're talking about is augmenting willpower. Huh. And it's a, a nutritional way to augment willpower. Because wow. you're not having these ebbs and flows in blood sugar. You know, there's multiple mechanisms in the body to deal with low blood sugar. But yeah. there's only one way to deal with high blood sugar is insulin. Hmm. So if you think, um, yeah, you've now simplified your life and you've made it so that you've augmented your willpower with dietary protein. The sources of dietary protein, because I, I do yeah. get these questions a lot. Yeah, um, let's talk about that. So in terms of leucine, because you mentioned these amino acids and you mentioned quality of protein. And I think sometimes people hear that and they think, oh, grass-fed versus conventional. Yeah. We're talking about quality of protein in the sense of animal protein versus plant protein and even um, quality of protein when it comes to beef versus chicken or beef versus lentils. Yeah. Every single food that contains protein is going to have a different um, – breakdown of amino acids yes. and thus a different quality. So are some better than others? And why is it harder to meet your goals on a vegan or vegetarian mm -hmm. diet? And if someone is dead set on being vegan for ethical reasons, yeah. because there are people who are in that place, yep. is there anything that they can do to supplement leucine or like help with the amino acids? Yeah. I, I, this is also another really good point. When you look at the back of a food label, mm -hmm. You'll see carbohydrates. It'll be broken down into fiber, sugar, whatever else. Like added sugar. Exactly. Yeah. And then when you see fat, fat is broken down, mm. saturated fat, trans fat, monounsaturated fat, and then you see protein. And it's just protein. It's just protein. And they don't break it down into the amino acids. Wow, you're eating for amino acids. Look at you helping things click for me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Keep telling us. <laughs> um. So... That just gives you an example of I, I can appreciate why and how so confusing everything yes. is. At the, ba at the at back of the food label, all it says is this measly word, protein. It says nothing about protein quality, but the reality is, again, we're not eating for protein. We're eating for these amino acids, some of which are essential and some of which are non-essential. And we're really focused on getting those essential amino acids. Mm -hmm. So the next question is like, oh my gosh, well, how can I make sense of this? You know, obviously, it's been totally mistreated, right, where we know that carbohydrates have their own breakdown and fats have their own breakdown, and now protein doesn't have its own breakdown, which I'm hoping will eventually change. Yeah. I think that that will change. There will be a scoring system, yeah. which uh, my mentor is, is actually working on now. And sometimes on a, a whey protein isolate, for example, they will give you a breakdown of the amino acids exactly. on the back. Exactly. Now, whey protein is a high quality protein. Mm -hmm. Again, how do we define high quality protein? We define it based on those essential amino acids. Mm -hmm. Non-emotional. It's not saying that chicken is, uh, you know, 
a better whatever. Um, like, whatever. moral choice or that you're a better. This is not a moral conversation. No, no, no. no, no. no, no. So the high quality proteins are typically a gravity bearing protein, which would be like chicken, bison, beef. Um, gravity bearing. What does that mean? Walks. Ah, huh. okay. Runs. So high quality proteins yeah. are alive and run around. Yeah, okay. Got it. I mean they can also swim, swim. <laughs> but those they actually have a lower protein quality. Okay. Um, or just a little a lower in the uh, amino acids. Okay. You just need a little bit more of them, but they're complete protein. They're very close. And is way up there with these yes, walking one of the best. proteins it versus is. like drinking a glass of milk? Um, milk is also a high quality protein. Okay. Whey has um, a higher leucine amount okay. because it's more of a, a concentrate. Yep. You know, it's kind of like skimmed off the top, but whey protein, dairy protein is really a uh, higher quality protein. Mm -hmm. Eggs. Mm -hmm. So these, again, are animal based products. Yeah. So, Okay, well, someone is vegetarian or vegan. What are how can they shift over to a more plant based vegetarian uh, sources of protein? You're looking at soy, mm -hmm. um, rice, pea blends, but again, those yeah. are processed foods, yeah, and they don't necessarily exist in nature. Well, wouldn't whey be processed or no? Because well, it's kind of whey part of you the can milk. yeah, you, can you skim, skim it, it off the, the top, but yeah, I mean, whey proteins can be processed as well. Yeah, uh, but again, if someone is more flexible in their diet, they can eat all different kinds of protein but if someone yeah. is really uh, bent on being vegetarian or vegan they're just going to have to be a bit creative okay in terms of how they can get the, the protein sources so so a rice and pea blend mm -hmm. would be ideal in terms of a vegan protein powder is that because of the blend of amino acids when mm -hmm. you combine the two yeah okay and then soy, is that also a little bit more ideal than something like rice and beans or? You know, in these plant-based proteins, there's other. Yes. Uh, the protein is bound to fiber. Yeah, and there's, there's other carbohydrates components. in there. There's a lot more calories. And there's different food matrixes. Mm -hmm. So for example, a beef would have a food matrix that has creatine and mm -hmm. uh, and serine and carnitine and taurine. And right? taurine. Yeah, these are all part of the food matrix. Choline versus mm. a plant may have more phytoestrogens or I mean there's still fiber and there's all again this is which they're great this is exactly this is not a conversation of one this is bad that. it's no. not no I believe that you should consume both oh, gosh um, and that we shouldn't uh, just consume one or the other yeah. right like it's so again the pendulum swings to extremes we have the plant base then we have carnivore we have just these sides where I'm like guys Let's eat plants and beef. Like, yeah. Let's right, do it right. all. Let's have it all. Variety is right. the spice of life. Diversity. There's the gut microbiome totally. element. And again, whereas I used to be someone who believed that your gut microbiome uh, determines your weight because that one study where they injected the mouse with the bad microbiome and it gained weight and that's why I can't lose weight. That's not the truth. But the gut microbiome is important. It does play a role. Things. But listen. Can you out train your gut microbiome? Yes. Uh, yeah. And can you change it with food even? <laughs> yeah. With whole, like less yeah, processed yeah. foods, more whole foods. Yeah. That happens too. So uh, there is this element of needing to help your gut microbiome and feed it. And that's where we have the plants. But then there's this element of having to feed your muscle. And that's where we have the animal protein. So Absolutely. Really and an again, omnivore. these are very nutrient dense sources of food. Yeah. Iron is a real challenge for especially women. Yeah. Um, and you know meats and things are the most bioavailable mm -hmm. form but doesn't spinach have iron uh, how bioavailable is that so what is bioavailability uh how much you can absorb why does something like heme iron from meat have a better bioavailability than spinach the way that the makeup is it's because of that matrix or like how, yeah of, okay. so the bioavail yes uh, spinach is also bound in fibers yeah so not to say you can't eat piles of spinach and like eat it all day long and get the same amount but who's gonna do that but it is the bioavailability is different yeah okay um, it's it's easier to absorb one you know beef and red meat is easier to absorb and yes i believe beef is a very healthy food source yeah um people get very offended by that but we've been eating it for you yeah. know millions of years i have a lot of people that wrote in and i really I want to explain this in a way that, again, to your point, is mm -hmm. non-emotional and just helps people to see the facts. And although it may be – there's a lot of um, empathy that comes into play with a vegan or vegetarian choice to, uh, choice of a diet. But I also think sometimes it's a, maybe a misplaced empathy or mm -hmm. like um, – you can be compassionate and also eat meat. That is the truth. And there's also regenerative agriculture that yeah. you can support. There's so many wonderful things that beef producers and animal producers are doing. Totally. For the environment, for the earth. And the environment is a whole different conversation. But um, 
if someone is still dead set on it, what like what happens if someone eats 110 grams of soy rice and pea protein in a day? Like, are they still going to see muscle growth? Are yeah, they, are they there going to be okay? They will. Okay. They'll probably need to have a little bit more. Okay. It'll be on the higher end. So uh, perhaps 110 grams of solely plant-based protein won't do it. They'll need to increase that total protein intake okay. to overcome uh, for some of those Aminos. lower amounts of, of amino acids. But okay. they totally can do it, especially if they're, they're young. Okay. Again, um, and the data would support that, that okay. they can absolutely do that if an individual um, – is concerned they could also add in a branch chain amino acid supplement with their meal. Okay. Um, okay. Well, these are these are good tips. And you're giving these tips also in the context of that's still not ideal. And that's also not going to be the easiest to do. I don't believe it's ideal. Yes. And I don't believe it's ideal over the long term. Yeah. I think that um, when individuals do that, habits become very difficult to change. And again, I'm a geriatrician by training, which yeah. means I have taken care of the end of life. And the habits that you develop in your 20s and 30s, are you still going to be eating that way in your 50s and 60s? I would say that can be very detrimental. Mm. Mm. Why is that? Because if you are dead set on going plant-based, you're likely more active when you're younger. Again, so these behaviors, Mm. how are those behaviors, you know, we always have to think one step ahead. How are those behaviors going to carry us forward? Yes. And that comes, that actually finishes full circle the question that we forgot to finish, which is what are the two ways to stimulate muscle protein synthesis? One is at least 30 grams of protein threshold per meal, and the other is resistance training. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is someone who's eating a vegan diet in their younger years is stimulating muscle protein synthesis synthesis by being active and that's compensating for some of these deficiencies in complete proteins and amino acids yes. but as they age they're not going to be as active perhaps or that activity is not going to have the same effect necessarily mm-hmm. and the dietary deficiency will become more apparent and they or if they're choosing to uh, get their dietary protein from plants they are likely going to be consuming a higher load of carbohydrates which mm. most people cannot tolerate okay. as they change their activity level. Before we talk about why with the carbohydrates, I just want to confirm, is it true that we need more protein than just the uh, pound of ideal body weight while in a caloric deficit or a fat loss phase when we're body recomping because a caloric deficit is a naturally catabolic state? I would say the lower your calories, the higher you need to keep protein. To just preserve totally. muscle mass. So yes. You're not... You're yep. sparing the muscle tissue. Exactly. And you're only losing from fat. Yes. Okay. I mean, you're never going to only be losing from fat. You're going to lose a little bit of lean mass. Mm-hmm. But yes, so you do the lower your total calorie intake, mm-hmm. the higher your protein needs to to conserve not just skeletal muscle, but lean tissue, okay. which would be organs as well. And I think there's also just confusion in the calorie conversation in general, because again, for a very long time, programs like... I'm going to throw shade at Weight Watchers again or whatever. <laughs> but whatever. Uh, calorie counting programs have just focused on calories. So I think calories have become, And calories totally matter. And they matter. And and they do matter. <laughs> and But it's also become a bit of a dirty word because restricting calories with no um, control for protein Huge can mistake. be dangerous, Huge leave mistake. you in a worse place, cause you to gain weight mm-hmm. back, lead to this restrictive mindset, you know, cause you to obsess over food because you're not satiated. There's so many bad things that can happen to being in a caloric deficit the wrong way, right? So um, I want to just help people understand calories from also a more scientific, non-emotional perspective. Mm -hmm. When I listened to your interview with Dr. Donald Lehman, and um, a lot of people ask me, how are you in a calorie deficit? How many calories do you eat? And I don't tell people how many calories I eat because it's going to be different for everybody. But in that interview, which I encourage you guys to listen to, I'll put a link, um, Donald Lehman said something very sensible. He said, instead of using these calorie calculators and yada yada, pick a number, right? For women, maybe it's 1,600 or 1,800 or whatever. Exactly. Eat at that for a week. Does your weight go up, go down, or maintain? Mm -hmm. Now you know where you're at and can go from there. And then as you build muscle, you can probably eat more calories and still be in a caloric deficit. So that's the goal. The goal is not to keep reducing calories. So it's not a restriction thing. It's a where am I at? How can I get into a slight deficit while maintaining my muscle to body recomp? And then how can I bring them up once I have more muscle? Absolutely. And, you know, we were talking before we started uh, filming, Alan Argon, who I had on my podcast, yes. has a great book called Flexible Dieting. Okay. It's phenomenal for people who want to dive deeper into understanding how many calories should I eat? How can I calculate my own diet? And, yeah. you know, regardless, understanding that 
calories matter, protein is a priority. Yep. And then the rest of the, you know, calories, people will say, okay, we'll add fat and then carbohydrates. Yeah. In the ways that you want. So I actually have yeah. a question about that. So I listened to this interview with Alan Aragon. Isn't that, he amazing? He is amazing. He's so good. And again, so logical. And I guess as I get older, I'm becoming a little more logical. It's kind of crazy. Who thought? Who thought? <laughs> when I met you, I think you, both you and Nina were doing the fruititarian diet. We were literally raw vegan. We were doing medical medium. I'm going to say it. Please don't do medical medium. Anyway. <laughs> but no, it's uh, you cannot you cannot just eat fruit all day or like. A high carb. No, because it's, it's, it really I mean, put me in such crazy. a bad place. It's crazy. Because I ate that way. I did it for a full month. Nina did it for much longer. But she did I it ate, for way longer. And this is so what long. your demographic is up against. I know, because we had Freely, the banana girl on YouTube in the 2010s, where she was telling everybody to eat banana and date smoothies all day so that they could look like her. And I, what happened to her? I mean, she now like lives in the jungle. Oh. I don't know. I wonder how, she probably says hi to my dad. <laughs> Neat dog, <laughs> who is but, also living in the jungle. I love that for him. <laughs> Interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, gotta love family. But um, yeah, we had these influencers on YouTube that were high carb vegan, and I and now we have people like Medical Medium, which I'm sure he means well, but um, they're leading people to eat these diets of just fruit or just fruit and vegetables and greens and. Not even sources of protein. Like, I don't even think Medical Medium recommends, like, beans and lentils and tofu and soy. Um, And I did that for a month. And, yeah, did I lose weight on the scale? Absolutely. And then the day that I started eating like a normal human again, I gained back two times more than what I lost Mm. because I lost muscle mass. And so I lost a metabolically active organ that was allowing me to eat at a certain level of calories. And now when I went back to my normal calorie diet, I was gaining from it. So... These quick fixes are so harmful. These diets that don't have the scientific backing are very harmful. And I love Alan Aragon because he talks about the science. And he also says you don't have to eat a perfect diet either. You don't have to be 100% unprocessed whole foods. Yeah, he's amazing. I'm pretty sure that I had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich uh, in my pocket during our interview. (laughs) It's true. Just to make him proud. I was like, no, I just, you know, with the kids and they're crazy. So I just whipped it on my But that's okay sometimes. It's all good, right? Just make sure you have a little steak after. Yes. And make sure that you're physically active. You have to train. And, you know, I don't want to go off in, in a rabbit hole, but people were very upset when I said, listen, Pilates isn't going to cut it. Mm. Is I just pa- made a video like that the other I mean, day. listen, is Pilates helpful? Yeah. But are we thinking about uh, when we think about strength? Yeah. Um, it, you, you're going to have to yeah. do things that are going to make you stronger. Are there ways in which that can be a priority? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It's. I recently started learning about muscle hypertrophy and um, the ways to stimulate <laughs> muscle hypertrophy and how the first one is mechanical tension. And I thought about it. Pilates doesn't really have that much mechanical tension. So you're not actually stimulating muscle growth, which is muscle hypertrophy. Well, you can, you can I guess, you can technically. In a lesser sense. Yes. So you can, but you're not going to have a progressive overload. But again, if we're talking about progressive overload or if you're even talking about meeting strength, yeah. um, you know, going for strength PRs and, and really looking to put on strength, yeah. I think that is going to be very hard with a, a lighter weight. I think the the way that I think about it is you have to keep challenging your muscle tissue, just like you have to keep challenging yourself in life. So do I go to Pilates? Yeah. Every week I go to one to two times a week. I used to think of it as my sole form of exercise. Mm-hmm. I thought I was going to look really good. Then five months later, I was like, I don't really I don't see that much of a change. I mean, my abs look okay, but I've always had a leaner stomach. Yeah. Um, so I can see my abs more, but that's just a function of hormones and genetics. But essentially, I realized that it's more, it's great for mobility. It's great for back pain. It's great for posture and core strength and combating sitting all day. It's amazing, but it's going to be part of my workout split. It's going to be a way that I recover. There you go. It's going to be a way that I support the lengthening of my muscles because after I just worked out, they want to shorten, right? (laughs) And they're tense. And it's going to be um, a way that I just kind of switch things up and spend time with myself. It's a great thing, but I, I know now that I have to put strength into the mix because continuously challenging my muscles with more and more weight every week or novel stimulus through different exercises every week is what's going to actually challenge and thus create change in the muscles. 
I as love it. Age. I, I can't wait to hear. <laughs> I'll get the full report. Oh my God, look, I just figured this out. I can't wait. So, okay, about the episode with Alan Aragon, just to close that loop, um, it really clicked for me when he made it clear that as long as you control for protein and calories, right, whatever yeah. your calorie maintenance or deficit number is, um, and whatever your protein goal is, as yeah. long as you control for those two things, the rest of your calories that you have left over can come from either carbs or fat. Mm-hmm. It doesn't really matter. And can essentially come from processed or unprocessed foods. Is there also other benefits to unprocessed foods like the gut microbiome conversation? Sure. But technically, you can have a healthy balance of processed foods in your life, let's say 80-20. So I wanted to ask you, from as a clinician who sees Mm -hmm. patients in your practice, would that recommendation of it can just be carbs or fat, do whatever you want with the rest of it, would that be the same for someone who's already insulin resistant or has PCOS? Or would someone like that do better to start with lower carb until they start training? Absolutely. I believe that they would do better with lower carb. Okay. Why is that? Because again, um, insulin resistance is going to be a challenge for uh, carbohydrate tolerance, Okay. how much carbohydrates they can manage. And does insulin resistance make it harder to lose weight? Totally. Okay, why? Yes. Um, Why does it make it? I mean, so there's mechanistic reasons why insulin resistance would make it more difficult to lose weight. Um, But the glucose has to go somewhere. Okay. Right? And if you're insulin resistant, you have a more difficult time moving glucose into the cell and thus utilizing it for energy. So... It doesn't necessarily have an impact on calories in, calories out. What a great question. Um, I've been Googling this. Can't figure it out. <laughs> I, I think that um, insulin resistance would impact your total calorie intake. Um, but what I would say is we'd have to think about wh- how many Why? calories that person has in general. And um, yes, I don't... Does it impact your... your basal metabolic rate how many calories you can eat per day or does it impact how many calories you do eat because you're you feel hungry and want more energy so this is this is a very challenging question does insulin resistance change the amount of calories that you would need to consume i would say most likely it doesn't however okay does it When we think about that, what are some of the other things that we think about that determine metabolism? Mm -hmm. And in my mind, I would think typically if someone is insulin resistant, they have unhealthy muscle. Okay. And if they have unhealthy muscle, muscle is what houses mitochondria. So So their mitochondria may be less efficient. Okay. But has there ever been a study? Could there be a study where someone says, okay, well, this person has insulin resistance, so they have a more of a calorie need, you know, or a, require more of a deficit. I don't know if we could say mm. that, but I will say insulin resistance is an unhealthy state, skeletal muscle insulin resistance, which if someone has insulin resistance, skeletal muscle, again, makes up 40% of the body yes. and the majority of mitochondria, Yes. right? Um, so they're probably not going to be incredibly efficient. Or how about this? They're less metabolically flexible. And That's metabolic what I wanted to under- okay. and metabolic flexibility is in so you think about the fed state and the fasted state. Got it. In the fed state, you're moving glucose out of the bloodstream mm-hmm. into the cells. So okay. you should be at that time being able to use and utilize and move glucose. In the fasted state, for example, skeletal muscle would likely be utilizing free fatty acids mm. or fatty acids. Using your own fat tissue. Yes. Or, yeah, fatty acids, depending on where you're getting it from, absolutely. If you're so in a caloric in, deficit, you're getting it from your own fat in, tissue. Yes. And in a fasted state, skeletal muscle will use fatty acids. This makes a lot of sense <laughs> because, just to give people an, a real-life example, again, from my own process, um, when I – started what I'm doing now essentially like two months ago with more protein lifting yada yada like really getting serious about diet um in the beginning I couldn't go the night I was eating adequate calories and protein I couldn't go the night without waking up hungry Hmm. and the person that I'm working with on um strength she was saying you probably are not very metabolically flexible so you're not able to just tap into your stores Hmm. overnight and create energy and be good while you're in a mm. fasted state. And as time went on, and, and so what she told me to do actually was go a little bit lower carb for that period to become Great. more metabolically flexible. So I went a little lower carb. 
I, and I sometimes had a midnight snack. <laughs> and I did not know this. Yeah, no, I was texting you like, oh my God, I, I don't wake up anymore. Now I ate 140 grams of protein. But it took a yeah, few yeah, weeks yeah. for that to happen, right? Like I think after a few weeks of eating enough protein, eating whole unprocessed foods, eating a little bit lower carb of a diet, I could feel my metabolic flexibility come back to earth because I was no longer waking up in the middle of the night starving and I could go for longer and longer periods of time without eating and say full sentences. You know, I wasn't hangry. I wasn't. Amazing. You had better blood sugar regulation. And people are going to ask you, your listeners are going to ask, well, how fast am I going to feel a difference? And I would say typically within two to four weeks, people will feel substantially better. That literally took that amount of time for me to stop waking up in the middle of the night hungry and be able to use my own fat for fuel. Amazing. But it took lower carbs in the beginning. So yes, in the grand scheme of things, you don't necessarily have to be on a low carb diet to Alan Aragon's point, And you also don't need to be on that forever. But when you're starting to initially improve metabolic flexibility, insulin resistance, mm-hmm. metabolic health with something like PCOS, what you're saying is on a mitochondrial level and on a metabolic flexibility level, it may be better to go through therapeutically low carb Absolutely. in the beginning. Okay. Absolutely. Good for women and, you to know. You know, for individuals who want to have higher carbs, you have to earn your carbs. Okay. So you typically want to increase carbohydrates as you increase training. Okay. You don't have to. I do really well on a higher carbohydrate diet. I find that now I do. Mm-hmm. Now I'm leaning out on higher carbs. Like it got to a point where my perfect my fat was almost stalled, lower carb. And so I brought in more carbs, especially pre and post training, and I'm leaning out again. Amazing. So your metabolism changes as you get healthier, and you actually can use carbohydrates for fuel at a certain point and can use it to lean out, lose fat, and get gains in the gym. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) But you you really highlight something super important, and what what you're saying is that – there was a period of time where perhaps you were less metabolically healthy. Yes. And you did something in a stepwise approach. And number one, you improved your metabolic health. Yes. And, and I did then, take the steps. Yeah. And yeah. then you started adding carbohydrates. And then you started having more flexibility. You're also moving more. And you improved your nutritional status. All the things. Yeah. Yeah. And again, for me, it was a journey of like my fasting insulin, right? We've been tracking that for Two-ish, two-ish years now, you kind of started testing for that? No, I've been testing for it well, the whole time. In terms of my lab court history, <laughs> um, no, but I, in terms of what I can remember, right, I started at a fasting insulin level of like 11, and then it went down to 7, and then it went down to 5. I probably have some of your earlier ones that were higher. Oh, God. I'll well, pull it up. But just to say, like, I want to give people hope that the uh, the jump from 11 to you 7 to 5 improve. happened you with can walking improve and that. then Pilates, and now it's probably... Uh, much better because I have muscle and I can feel that I'm metabolically more flexible. So I know you said 30 to 50 grams Mm -hmm. in a sitting, let's say, especially if someone's doing two big meals a day and then a smaller meal. Is it true that our bodies can only absorb a certain amount of protein? Like, is there a ceiling? So is there a per meal ceiling? Is there a per day ceiling? Great Great one. Um, No. (laughs) Uh, You absorb all that you eat. The question is, what extra benefit are you looking for? For example, if you hit beyond 50 grams of protein, are you getting extra benefit? Mm -hmm. From a muscle protein synthesis standpoint, from a muscle standpoint, probably not. But again, we talked about that the body has protein turnover of 250 grams throughout the whole day. Mm -hmm. So that excess uh, protein that you're not utilizing for protein uh, muscle protein synthesis will be utilized for other things. Okay. Like your hair or your skin or your nails. Okay. Yes. So you can't technically eat too much protein? We've never seen that to be possible. Got it. So there's no like I mean, I'm sure obese. that there's a protein upper limit. Mm-hmm. We just haven't seen it in the okay. literature. So it's like marijuana. You can't overdose on marijuana. I can't overdose on protein. No. You're like, maybe you can. Do not <laughs> do that. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, what about those who experience constipation when they up their protein? Because this is something I hear a lot. I got a lot of questions about this. Why can that be a common barrier? What's behind it? And what can people do about it so they can meet those needs? Number one, um, uh, perhaps increased fluids. And is it that they – is it due to the protein or do they cut back on fiber? Mm, okay. Um, so they're making a correlation between why well, I increased my protein, but is it that you increased protein or did you actually decrease your water intake or did you decrease your fiber intake? Um, your body should adjust and, you know, magnesium oxide at night can be great. Obviously check with your physician, but yeah. there's super simple ways. Okay. I've heard you say a lot in this interview, unhealthy skeletal muscle. And that that's, I've heard you say on other podcasts, that's the primary site of development for the diseases we're seeing later on in life. I understand what you're saying about 
healthy skeletal muscle being the disposal site yeah. for glucose, which is why it would help prevent diseases later in life, like Absolutely. diabetes, et cetera. But can you just explain what unhealthy skeletal muscle is mm -hmm. and why it gives way to chronic disease? Yes. So the concept of unhealthy skeletal muscle, in my mind, I think about something called myosteatitosis. Mm. Sounds like a swear word. Probably should be, but it's not. And it is fat infiltration in skeletal muscle and around the tissue. What does that look like on a human being? Can you see it? You can see it under imaging, Okay. right? So you can't actually, you can't look at a human and see it, but often we do see it on a CT or MRI. Okay. So it's, a, and, and some of it is so small you can't see it. But a, a good way to think about it would be um, fat infilled, like a, a marbled steak. Mm. That is unhealthy skeletal muscle. And arguably any skeletal muscle that you are not moving will become unhealthy. Now, the next question is, is it uh, unhealthy the same way that adipose tissue would be unhealthy? I would say it's not. The difference is, is when skeletal muscle is unhealthy over a period of time, it can also become fibrotic, mm. meaning you have decrease in strength, you have decrease in glucose disposal, you know, uh, mitochondria are not as robust as they could be or once were. Can you reverse that mm. fibrotic effect? The great question. I am not convinced that you can, so you don't want to get to that sarcopenic place. Is that why my calves don't look good? No, no, you are way too young to have irreversible <laughs> sarcopenic effects. Okay, because it's really hard for me to. And listen, this my calves. I, we're we're talking about this now. This might change. Yeah, science will continue to develop and change, but this could change. So again, the earlier you start and the you have, it's a non-negotiable. Quicker you take action, it's the better off you're going to be. Yeah. Okay, so um, how do you turn? How do you get that fat out of the muscle? Is Exercise, it just, flux. It's just building it. It's like, is, are you no. like literally pushing the no, fat no. out? Uh, when I think about this different model of obesity and I think about the health of skeletal muscle, again, I think in the middle, if individuals could uh, visualize this, is muscle capacity. So mm -hmm. think about muscle capacity. And then I think what influences muscle capacity. I think about resistance training. And the way I think about resistance is I do think about strength and hypertrophy. Um, I, I'm trying not to use them interchangeably. Strength is one thing, and then training for hypertrophy is actually training for growth. But there is that um, uh, one aspect. And then I think about endurance training. Mm -hmm. Again, we're thinking about what feeds into muscle capacity, endurance training. When I think about muscle capacity, I think about mitochondria. Mm. And then the third leg of what I think about when I think about muscle capacity is I think about anaerobic type training, specifically high intensity interval or sprint interval training. Mm. So when I think about healthy muscle, I would pick from each one of those things. Hmm. Strength, depending on if you're looking for strength. So strength is being able to go up and wait every week or two weeks in terms yes, of what you're your, lifting. Yes. That's one thing. Hypertrophy would be different. Hypertrophy would be increasing the storage space of your suitcase. So that's increasing the physical size of your muscles exactly. that you can see. Okay. Exactly. And then the third? Would be endurance, so increasing mitochondria function. So increasing your cardiovascular fitness? Exactly. Okay. So that's where aerobic exercise comes exactly. in. Exactly. And then fourth would be really pushing that flux we were talking about, getting um, that high-intensity interval training, sprint interval training, can lower insulin resistance, skeletal muscle insulin resistance, hmm. can really tap into uh, muscle. When you say sprint interval training, do you mean Max out capacity. Workouts? I do. Do you mean sprinting there you go. down the street? Well, I'm a terrible sprinter, so <laughs> I don't mean that. So you mean but anything yes, that's max at almost your max? Okay. Exactly. Okay. And, and how much do you have to do that per week? Not very much. Okay. Maybe one session to uh, one session a week. You know, it can be four minutes, ten minutes. Very, very oh, okay. small. I yeah. could sprint for four minutes. Yeah. I well, mean, I mean, like, so it, <laughs> right. So it would be an all-out effort and rest. Most people don't do sprint interval training because that's really intensive. It takes okay. a lot of mental fortitude. Most people do high-intensity interval training, which may be which closer close. to eighty to eighty-five percent. But know, that's versus, still beneficial. Yes, yes. So would it be good for someone to hit the gym and lift weights three times a week? Um, do a HIIT workout one time a week and then do Pilates twice a week. Is that sure. enough? Um, yes. And then I would add in some kind of aerobic activity. Oh, okay. So could that be walking or does that have to be running? doesn't have to be running. It could be walking at a, a faster pace. Okay. So I'm, I'm kind of hitting everything. I got to just add in my one HIIT. And that's what when we think about – when I think about skeletal muscle health, those are the domains I really think about. And then, of course, obviously, how do you recover that tissue? 
with dietary protein. Dietary protein, yeah. Look at that. Now you got it. Okay, let's circle back to cognitive decline because you know that's very close to my mm-hmm. heart. It's really, for me, my biggest motivator and probably why I got so serious finally this year and just finally got it. Um, besides eating adequate protein and strength training, what else can we be doing to prevent cognitive decline? What about someone who worked out every day of their life but still developed Alzheimer's? And I've seen it. And there's yeah. a genetic component. So, you know, when we talk about Alzheimer's, it's not just Alzheimer's. That's kind of a catch-all term. There's mm. uh, Alzheimer's of the vascular type, yeah. right? There is early onset Alzheimer's. But what I think that you're saying is how do we maintain a sharp cognitive function throughout all of life? Yes. And for that... It does require mental stimulation, Mm. and exercise also is really important and imperative. Exercise as it relates to increasing BDNF, and there's also other things like irisin, and there's multiple, there's hundreds of myokines. BDNF is is really the big one as it relates to brain function because we do know that it can cross the blood-brain barrier, but there's also mechanisms within the brain in and of itself. Um, And obviously, uh, challenging yourself mentally Mm -hmm. is important. And then I would say really important is managing insulin and glucose. Mm. The, the brain is an organ which is no different. And understanding that just as you get diabetes in the body, you can get diabetes in the brain. Really? The mechanisms are different. But so your yes. brain can no longer respond to glucose? You become – that's a, a your brain will always respond to glucose. Always. That's extreme. Um, should respond to glucose. But you can become somewhat insulin resistant. Really? In the brain, yeah. And what would that look like? Would that it's look like, like eating a meal a and, and it, you're not responding to that meal or? Um, well, um, I think that you, you would see it in the periphery first. Mm. So you would see it in the your blood first. You would see it on a continuous glucose monitor first before we're talking about in central nervous system insulin resistance. And this is why the conversation is so nuanced. This is why, yes, body composition is calories in, calories out, but blood sugar regulation, insulin, and all the hormones and the things we talk about. There's in the all things world, that happen, right? There's they like, matter for longevity. They matter for cognition. Yeah. And there's all, there's, there's uh, sphingolipids. There's all kinds of things, right? Ceramides, which people will talk about. But again, for the listener, for, from Just, a listener standpoint, yeah. uh, peripheral body uh, You'll see it in the tissue in the body first. So take yes, care of the body. You would typically the see it. The primary site arguably would be skeletal muscle first. So is there like a, a hard and fa- – besides, again, what you're saying, the keeping blood sugar stable, um, exercise, or both aerobic fish and oil, strength. right? Omega-3 fatty acids. Yeah, what should we acids. be looking out for? So fish oil, what about B vitamins? Do those matter? Yes, they okay. do. Um, so in my clinical experience when I was a fellow in geriatrics, we always looked at homocysteine mm-hmm. and B vitamin metabolism. So B6, B12, mm-hmm. yes. All of that is very important for neuronal function. So yeah. someone should be asking their physician to test homocysteine. I think that it's very valuable. Okay. Yes. And if homocysteine is high, something like yeah, maybe a, a, B methyl- vitamin, a B vitamin, a B vitamin, depending on what the issue is. Yeah. Okay. But that's also just one piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Any other um, lab tests that we should be looking out for or having our doctor test regularly? Or is there a particular diet we should be so the evidence, the evidence would support more of a Mediterranean style diet, and I believe that that's one way you just keep body composition under control. Mm-hmm. And then again, there's phytonutrients and polyphenols mm-hmm. and the omega threes. Okay, so acids. also what were you know whole foods, colorful foods, yeah. fiber, antioxidants, you know mm-hmm. berries, things like that. That's also what matter. we would always give a a brain function diet, which would have blueberries and walnuts mm-hmm. and fish. Yeah, I love that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, So you said that genetics matter when it comes to Alzheimer's. And I have a a question from a friend of mine who wrote in and said that she's really confused with all the information out there in terms of the APOE4 gene Mm -hmm. and saturated fat. She's afraid to eat protein because she feels like she's going to eat the saturated fat. And so she's now on kind of like a vegan or vegetarian diet. She should test her blood levels. So if she eats a higher fat diet and her... Uh, fats go through the roof, then she might not be a great candidate for, say, like a keto diet. Okay. And if so, she can still still eat um, a lower saturated fat diet in terms of lean protein. Absolutely. But she doesn't have to cut out the meat necessarily. No. Okay. Right. So it's just keeping your overall fat intake, including saturated fat, lower. Okay. Got it. Um, Quick fire listener questions. Real life meal examples of getting more protein in. 
So yesterday we ordered from a place called, um, so Shane ran the New York City Marathon <laughs> untrained. So I ordered food and I got a grass-fed beef patty wrapped in lettuce Always. and a kale salad. There you go. And it better be home. It better be there when I get home. <laughs> I love that. I love ordering a burger on a lettuce bun. I think that's a great hack. Also, just protein shakes at home really quick. Yeah. Great. Whey protein, like you said, is the best. If you can't tolerate dairy, the rice and pea And I'm pretty mix. sure you've got protein brownies in your purse for me. I do have protein brownies Don't for you. Don't forget. Um, real life examples of protein snacks. My favorite, personally, is the biltong from Piedmontese. I have those, too. It is about 32 grams of protein in that bag of beef jerky. It's the best quick protein snack. And you can have it with an apple or something that's antioxidant rich on the side. And you have this beautiful, complete snack. Any other snacks you love? Um, Like Epic Bars or? I love Epic Bars. Okay. Yes. So okay. I always travel with the Bison Cherry Epic Bar. Amazing. And I would say oysters. I'm like, oh, should I say that? Yeah. Let's do um, it. Oysters. That's, yeah. Oysters I mean, it's not a quick it. snack. You got to go to like a French. You know, it's just like, I can't believe I'm not going to open this on the plane. I'm dead. <laughs> oh, you mean your, can your tinned oysters? Yeah. No, I don't open them on the plane unless oh. I'm desperate. Okay. Okay. So you're hardcore. I love it. Yeah. No, you're, you're in it. Come on. Okay. Um, does it matter how clean your protein source is, i.e. grass-fed versus conventional? I um, I don't think so. So it's more about if you want grass-fed, it's voting with your dollar in terms yeah, of regenerative it's expensive and it should be. But it's a financial barrier. It's a financial barrier. So they all got the same amino acids. They all have the same amino acids. They may have different omega-3 fatty acid uh, ratios. They may have different CL, okay. uh, conjugated linoleic acid. They may yeah. have different nutrient profiles slightly, but again – is it critical? Mm. Okay. You know, you're not really eating beef for omega-3 fatty acids. Better to eat the protein than break the bank totally. on grass-fed protein. Um, metabolic flexibility. Anything we can do besides lowering carbohydrates for a period of time to improve metabolic flexibility? Do whole unprocessed foods help? Um, the biggest push is going to be um, high-intensity interval training, some type of uh, metabolic conditioning. Okay. Love it. Last one. How important is the microbiome when it comes to the partitioning of calories? So does gut health have a major effect on calories in, calories out, or is it just a small factor and muscle matters more? I don't think we know. I would say muscle matters more. Okay. Love but it. But again, I, I don't I don't think we know that answer, but you can't really uh, determine what your gut microbiome is going to do. It would be very much giving over power, power versus, you know, exactly what you can do with your muscle. Love it. Can I mean, you that's like the plug truth, yourself? right? Can yeah, you yeah, tell yeah. us yeah. where to find yeah, yeah, yeah. you, how to work with you, and about your podcast? Yes. Um, so you were going to ask me what's the first thing that people should do, and I'll say I'll uh, obviously prioritize protein and really get a sense and understanding of where their dietary protein is coming from and how they're getting it. I actually have a free protocol, which you've had forever. Yes, yes. Go to my website. You can download it, and then they can have a list of foods so they can actually see mm. what they're doing, right? Um that would be the first thing. If people want to work with me or my team, so actually I have a full team. I don't even think that you know that. Well, you just, I know you have like an, another doctor that's now seeing. Brian Stepanenko. Okay. Yes. And then also, do you know, I have a PA, Colleen. No. Yeah. Congratulations. Yes, Colleen Johnson. Amazing. And then do you know that we also have a health coach, Alexia Bell Rose, oh. and a person who runs the operations, Peter Roth, and then Kylie Fignano, who's a registered dietitian. And then we have um, consulting PhDs. Amazing. Alexis Cowan, Dr. Donna Lehman. So it's a whole team. So long story short, if people are interested in becoming a patient, they can apply. Mm -hmm. um, or if they know somebody who is already a patient, it's interview process only. Okay. Um, and I do have a podcast and I'm very proud of it. And I spend a lot of time and a lot of energy curating guests and questions and having really transparent conversations. You do. And that's called the Dr. Gabrielle Lyon Show. Easy Not, to remember. Yeah, right, it's super. Yeah. I really wanted to call it something else, but people were like, well, but what if people can't find you? I was no, like, okay. I think it's smart. Also have a YouTube, which is where you got some of this really good information. Yep. And I'm very active on Instagram and Twitter. Yep. Did I miss anything? And I have a great newsletter. Yeah, you really do. Constantly mm -hmm. with those, um, the, the subject lines really get me. They hook me in. <laughs> do they really? I'm like, am I meeting my goals? <laughs> am, do I want to be successful? Oh my God, let me click and see. No, it's good. Yeah, everything you offer is great. And following you on Instagram, I mean, it's just going to hammer home what we talked about. I highly recommend following Dr. Lyon on every platform you can. Every time you listen to an interview of yours, it's, I just take something new each time. So I just appreciate so much what you're doing for this world and the service that you are. To me and others, I'm going to get really emotional, but I love you. Thank I love you. you too. I'm really proud of you. Thank you. Wasn't that great?